Am I on? <laughs> Good evening. I'm Ann Kennedy, and I welcome you to Tales of Cape Cod's live program, streaming from the 1763 Old Colonial Courthouse in historic Barnstable Village. Before I introduce tonight's guest, I do want to tell you about a new feature we have, which is our encore presentation. That that means if you miss tonight's program or any of our programs going forward, you can, for $10, watch it, go on our website, click on the program, and watch it for the next five days after that program's first live streaming. We've also added a feature called pay per view, which means that we've put some of our oldies but goodies, some of our most popular programs, up for your viewing pleasure for $5. In fact, uh, tonight's author and speaker, Janet Ular, last year uh, gave a wonderful presentation on the Whitey Bul Bulger trial called Truth Be Damned. And she, that program is one of our featured programs. I'd also like to, before I introduce tonight's guest, quickly preview our next week's program. Long Pasture Audubon Director Ian Ives will be with us, and he will talk to us about the gems of Vineyard Sound, the Elizabeth Islands from 1641 and beyond. This hidden island chain holds many secrets, both historical and natural, and Ian will reveal them in this fascinating virtual exploration. So we hope you'll join us. Tonight, however, we are very pleased to welcome back to the Colonial Courthouse stage, Cape Cod author, Janet Ular. Janet, who now lives in East Ham, was born in Quincy, Massachusetts, the hometown of John Adams, John Quincy Adams, Josiah, Adams, uh, Josiah Quincy, and John Hancock. Janet believes that when the private lives and unique personalities of historical figures are presented, history becomes more than cold black print on a stark white page. History instead takes on a life of its own with true flesh and blood individuals whose act of courage or indifference or cowardice shape the world that we live in today. Janet's topic tonight is presented in her book, The Freedom's Cost, available through her website, www.janetular.net, or through Amazon. General Nathaniel Green, you will learn, was a particular favorite of George Washington and Martha Washington, but he was also a revolutionary star on his own. So here to tell us more is our guest, Janet Ular. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here and I'm um, extremely delighted to be talking about Nathaniel Green. Many people um, don't know much about him. He's kind of been uh, kept back in history, negated actually. And as I go on with the program, I will explain why and how that happened. But in truth, Nathaniel Green was the savior of the Continental Army. And again, I will explain that to you. <clears throat> He's not well known um, in the North, unfortunately, even though he was born and reared in Rhode Island. But I have found when I present his story to Southern audiences, they recognize him more than Northerners do. And We'll talk about that as well. So a lot to cover here. Okay. Um, he was an iron master. As I said, he was born in Rhode Island. He was born in the East Greenwich area of Rhode Island, the son of an iron master. The family actually had a number of businesses, different mills, you know, and two iron forges. And in the iron forges, they made anchors for ships and they made the chains that would hold those anchors. And the senior Nathaniel Green 
had eight sons, no daughters whatsoever, and eight sons, and they all began working in the iron forges at a fairly young age. So you can imagine the build on these guys. I mean, they were well built and you would not want to get one of them mad at you and meet him in a dark alley, I assure you. But you'd probably be safe because the, uh, the Greens were Quakers, Rhode Island Quakers. In fact, Nathaniel's father, Nathaniel Sr., was referred to as the Quaker preacher. And if you know anything about Quakers, you know that they don't have preachers. So that kind of gives you an idea of the strictness of his father in regard to their religion. And this you're seeing now is a picture of a, a colonial Quaker meeting house. i go back a little here. This is the home that Nathaniel was born in. The house was built in 1686 by a Green and remains in the Green family to this day. Um, obviously, it's been renovated a little bit here. I have had the um, unique um, honor of being able to spend time in this house with Mr. Green, who lives there now. <clears throat> When Nathaniel was about 29 years old, he left the homestead and he built his own house in what is now called Coventry, Rhode Island. It was Anthony at that time. Um, he uh, moved to the Coventry area because they had built another forge there and he was going to oversee that forge. Nathaniel took on a lot of responsibilities in the family business. He was actually the fourth son named for his father and said to have been the father's favorite son. Nathaniel was more curious than his brothers, it seems. He wanted to um, learn more than what the strict Quaker upbringing offered him. And he asked his father for a tutor to teach him more. And the subjects he was very interested in as a young man were, oddly enough, um, geometry, which you could say might have something to do with forging the iron, but also military histories. And of course, he could not let his parents know that he was reading about military history because that wouldn't go over well with a Quaker family, especially if your dad's referred to as the Quaker preacher. So he would get these books and he would take them um, back at the family homestead. He would go up above the kitchen area where it was warm all the time, a room above the kitchen, and he would read his books there away from the family and away from his mother and father knowing what he was reading about. Now we'll catch up here. Nathaniel obtained many of his books in Boston. He um, took care of the family businesses, the legal aspects of it as well. And he would travel to Boston frequently. And when in Boston, he would go to a bookstore there, which was owned by a man named Henry Knox. And you might recognize that name. Um, so Henry would become a general in the Continental Army. And Nathaniel and Henry had quite a friendship going even before the war began. And Henry would be buying books for the British soldiers that were occupying Boston, the British officers. And he would read the books when they came in and he would tell Nathaniel what books they were ordering and Nathaniel would order the same books. So these two gentlemen who at this point had no idea of what their future held were learning through books how to become generals. Also when uh, Nathaniel went to Boston, Henry uh, he helped Henry smuggle out a British drill sergeant who wanted to leave the British Army and a number of Brown Bess's muskets, get, getting them out of Boston into Rhode Island. Now, Nathaniel in 1772 started to become involved in what was going on with the American Revolution. He was a practicing Quaker actually up until 1774. But in 1772, there was um, a situation in Rhode Island, which is referred to as the Gaspi Affair, in which a British um, boat was burnt to the ground. 
the British um, had burnt one of the Greens ships prior to this, and the colonists in Rhode Island retaliated and burnt this British ship to the ground. It was as um, exciting, if you will, or um, important as the Boston Tea Party was, but it didn't get the attention the Boston Tea Party did. Now, the British blamed Nathaniel Green for the burning of the British ship. Uh, but up until his dying day, he said he had nothing to do with the burning, but it did spark this interest in becoming involved in standing against the British crown. At that time, the British governor in Rhode Island was a staunch Tory. So um, the Rhode Island patriots weren't getting too far with their governor supporting the British as he was. Now, in 1774, in the, the area Nathaniel was, Coventry and East, East Greenwich area, a uh, militia group started to form called the Kentish Guards, and the Kentish Guards actually still exist to this day. Um, he helped to form the Kentish Guards. He was run out of uh, the Quakers' meetings over it. They kind of disowned him because of it. He provided the muskets to them that he got from Henry Knox, and he provided the, um, the, the drill sergeant also who had deserted. British guards decided that they were going to um, vote on officers. They did not vote for Nathaniel Green, even though he had given them so much. You see, Nathaniel Green had a limp and they th thought that was undignified for an officer in the Kentish Guards. So he remained a private. He was mortified, as he said in the letter, that he wasn't giving, uh, given a, a rank, but we know that he marched with the other privates um, and did what he you know, felt he needed to do at that time. Now, the reason I told you he had a limp and they didn't think that that was uh, distinguished for an officer to have a limp. And the reason he had this limp, at least through the family it's been passed on, is that you can see this little bedroom area and that bedroom area is not much bigger than that picture there, okay? I've been in it, I can tell you. Um, and Nathaniel, it is said by the family, would climb out that window right there next to the bed to attend dances in town. Of course, he had to sneak out because Quakers weren't supposed to attend dances. Um, his parents' bedroom, you actually had to walk through the parents' bedroom to get to Nathaniel's little cubbyhole bedroom. So he would climb out and climb back in when he came back. Well, one night it said that he climbed out and he fell off the little shed that he would land on and fell to the ground and he hurt his, his knee. And by the time he got back from the dance, because indeed he did go to the dance, um, he was in severe pain and he knew that he couldn't climb back, back in. So he actually went into the shed, filled his riches with some shingles went up and walked through his parents' bedroom knowing that they would wake up. And when his father discovered him sneaking in like that late at night, he gave him a good whipping. Um, and when there are children in attendance, well, older children, I like to say he was 19 years old at this time, okay? He lived under his father's roof when he was supposed to abide by his father's rules. Nope, oh, pressing the wrong thing here, folks. When, I'm going to go back because I just gave you a hint here. When uh, the Battle of Bunker Hill took place, the Kentish Guards and two other Rhode Island militia companies were marching toward Boston to help the Massachusetts colonists in uh, standing against the British. Nathaniel um, was seen walking in the ranks, and I'm sorry, it wasn't Bar Bunker Hill, it was um, Lexington and Concord. Nathaniel was seen walking in the ranks as a private. People did journal it in their diaries, and the reason they noted him in the ranks was because of his limp. Um, before 
these three militia regiments got to the Massachusetts Rhode Island border, they were turned around by the new governor who was a patriot and um, he wanted to assemble the different units together with one commanding officer over them before they went to Massachusetts. And the General Assembly of Rhode Island um, sat for about four days before they decided who would be appointed as the commanding officer, the Brigadier General of the Rhode Island Forces. We have no records of that meeting. We don't know exactly what came down in that meeting. All we do know is literally overnight, Private Nathaniel Green became Brigadier General of the Combined Forces of Rhode Island, and thank God he did. Nathaniel's response to it was they tried to give it to a Baptist, he wouldn't take it. They tried to give it to a Congregationalist, and he wouldn't take it, so they gave it to the newly fallen Quaker. He was joking, of course. <laughs> Nathaniel was in uh, Massachusetts before George Washington arrived and had his regiment set up um, in proper order. And when Washington came and was reviewing his troops, he noted the neatness of the Rhode Island camp. And he noted the proper protocol of his commanding officer, Nathaniel Green. Green and Washington became immediate friends, and Green would go on to be Washington's confidant. In fact, um, Washington didn't like Nathaniel Green to be too far from his side. He always wanted him close by to be able to, um, you know, talk to and throw things off. Nathaniel Green did become known as the strategist of the American Revolution. And again, and especially when children are in the audience, I like to point this out, he learned it all through books. He actually never lifted his weapon in um, battle until um, the, the Battle of Trenton. So, I mean, a pretty amazing situation, and the same with Henry Knox, who would become Colonel of Artillery and then General of Artillery. And I always like to introduce the wives. Um, you see here is a younger version of Martha Washington. And this is Katie Green. We have no actual portrait of her as a younger woman but that would be Katie. Now, Katie was about the age of Martha Washington, that Martha Washington's daughter, Patsy, would have been. Patsy died as a young teenager. And Katie had the same coloring, the dark hair and that, that Patsy would have had. Martha actually became like a mother to Katie. Um, they were very close. And of course, Nathaniel and George and all, all of them, very, very close friends. In fact, Katie and Nathaniel would name their first son, George Washington Green, and their first daughter, Martha Washington Green. The officers that Green befriended and had close connections with were, of course, George Washington, you see here, the Marcus de Lafayette, the boy general, as they referred to him. He was only 18 years old when he came and became a major general in the Continental Army. Lord Sterling, and of course, Henry Knox. Then we had Mad Anthony Wayne, who was also a general from Pennsylvania. And another very close intimate friend was Alex Hamilton, as they referred to him. We know him as Alexander. In fact, um, Nathaniel Green was the one that introduced um, Alexander Hamilton to George Washington. Prior to that, Hamilton had been with Henry Knox in the artillery. And as soon as Washington met Hamilton, he wanted to bring him into his military family. And it's said that Henry Knox never really forgave Nathaniel Green for that introduction. We're gonna move uh, fast forward here to the Battle of Brandywine Creek. As I said, I refer to Nathaniel Green as the savior of the Continental Army. And I can count at least three times he actually accomplished this, and this would have been the first time. 
The Battle of Brandywine Creek occurred in September, actually September 11th of 1777. And George Washington, at this, by this time, Nathaniel Green was a major general and he commanded a division, which was approximately about 3,000 men. And during this battle, Washington wanted to hold Green and his division out in reserve, and he sent in another general um, by the name of John Sullivan from Rhode Island in to fight the British. Uh, it, was, it was bad. The British were winning. Um, they were basically slaughtering the, the Americans, and about four o'clock that afternoon, and you have to understand that this day, September 11th, was much like today, um, close to 100 degrees out. And so Washington sent word to Green that he needed to move his division forward quickly to cover a retreat for John Sullivan's division. Nathaniel Green understood how vital it was to get there that basically the Continental Army's existence depended on this retreat. And he was able to move his division, let's say four miles in less than an hour. It's a feat that hasn't been replicated to this day, I'm told. And in doing that and, and being there to support the retreat, the Continental Army was literally saved that day. And from there, September 1777, we go to Valley Forge, and we all know about Valley Forge. We all learned about it in school, right? Numerous times we, we talked about Valley Forge. So they went in in December of 1777, and we know that the situation was grave of the Continental Army going in. The reason being, Thomas Mifflin, who had been the quartermaster general of the army, had all but abandoned his post in supplying the army. Now, a quartermaster general has to supply the army with everything you can imagine. Uh, food, supplies, um, even when they're going to be going out on a march, he has to have food and supplies ready for them along that route. He has to have boats ready for them if they're going to approach a river. Um, anything you can imagine down to latrine tools he had to have prepared. And Mifflin had just stopped preparing. And that's why this army went into Valley Forge in the condition they went in. We all know the story, the bloody footprints in the sand. They were dying, they were sick, they were starving, they had no supplies. But when they came out in June of 1778, they faced the British on the battlefield in Monmouth, and the battle was a draw. They stood against the mightiest army on the face of the earth at that time, and they held the ground, they held their own. Now my question was, how does a dying, starving army with no supplies face the British and hold their own? Now we were taught, I told you, we were taught numerous times about Valley Forge at school. Remember third grade, sixth grade, eighth grade, 12th grade? Valley Forge, bloody footprints in the sand, we all know it. And we were taught that the reason they came out and they were able to face the British and hold their own was because of, oh, that's Baron von Steuben. Remember, General von Steuben came and he trained the troops. He trained them. And they came out beautiful. How do you train starving, dying men? Nobody seemed to ask that question. And the dots just didn't connect. Nathaniel Green was hounded, I mean hounded, by Congress and by his dear friend George Washington to take over the quartermaster general's position. He fought it, he fought it, he fought it. He said nobody ever hears of quartermaster generals in the golden pages of history. And I think he might be right, because can you name the present quartermaster general of the army? Mm -mm. 
probably one of the most vital posts there is in supplying all the troops, but we don't hear much about them. But Green um, gave in, and I think I'm trying to see March in March of 1777, 1778. He took the post of quartermaster general, and within three weeks, he had supplies, food, uh, munitions coming into Valley Forge. And it wasn't until after he took this post that von Steuben began training and drilling the troops. Now, um, when Nathaniel was at camp, his wife Katie came to stay with him that winter. That was the custom. The, the uh, armies would not fight in the winter season, neither army. And the, the general's wives would often come and stay with their husbands. This is an older portrait of Katie Green. Um, so she came that winter along with Martha Washington and many other wives. And during that winter, she conceived a child. Unfortunately for Katie, every time she came to visit Nathaniel, she conceived a child and went home pregnant. But this one is, um, I just think it's so special. This is Cornelia Lott Green. She is the third child of, um, of Nathaniel and Katie. She was conceived at Valley Forge, and we have this um, old timey picture of her when she's in her 80s. I just think it's amazing to have that picture. Now, if you went to the website of the Valley Forge National Historic Park in 2000, early 2015, you would not see Nathaniel Green mentioned on their website whatsoever. Um, and today, if you go, he is now mentioned, but just briefly, really. It's not really getting into his, uh, what he undertook as quartermaster general and how he turned things around there at that time. And the reason there was a change in 2015 that they started mentioning him was because there was a statue dedicated at Valley Forge um, of Nathaniel Green at the Washington Memorial Chapel. This same talk I'm giving this evening, I gave to the triennial of the Sons of the Revolution in 2012. And within 12 hours of hearing the story of Nathaniel Green, they decided to raise the funds for this full-size bronze statue and have it placed at Valley Forge. And Nathaniel is actually, the statue is overlooking the fields where the men would have been encamped that he was bringing the supplies to and keeping alive or bringing back to life. And it was an honor because the acting quartermaster general at that time gave um, the keynote address in the dedication. It was a marvelous, marvelous ceremony. Green stayed in the position of quartermaster general. He fought with uh, Congress, not wanting to take it, as I mentioned. And um, finally, when he decided to take it, he did it under certain conditions. He said he would cover the post for a year and get things straightened out. And then he wanted to return as bat a battlefield commander. And actually he made arrangements with George Washington if they went into battles, such as the Battle of Monmouth when they came out of Valley Forge, that he would be given command of a division even though he was quartermaster general. And that worked for a year. Um, he also wanted to appoint his own um, assistants in the quartermaster's department. So um, after a year, though, his fellow generals started to get annoyed that he could walk in and take over command of their, their troops um, that they had prepared for battle. So they were starting to, to talk about it. And um, Congress decided that they were going to revamp the entire quartermaster's department and they were going to get rid of his assistants. So when the year was up, um, Green wanted out of the quartermaster's position, but they were not going along with the agreement. Um, I like to say, you know, there's really nothing new under the sun, you know, Congress then, Congress now, oh well. Um, so he fought with them to get out of this position and they were holding him captive. 
and he was sending many letters to the congressman. Um, and you read the letters and they seem, you know, polite and all that stuff. But I guess he was annoying a lot of congressmen, not only with trying to hold them to the agreement, but also because he was constantly in the two years he was quartermaster general, he was demanding that they supply the troops properly, that they make sure that the different uh, states now were, were coming up with the funds to supply the troops. The problem that happened and continued on in the revolution was if the Continental Army wasn't in your state, it was basically out of sight, out of mind. Massachusetts was willing to take care of them when they were Massachusetts, but when they were out, not so much. Pennsylvania was willing when they were in Pennsylvania, but when they were out, not so much. And there were supposed to be taxes levied to take care of the Continental Army, and Congress was hesitant to do what they were supposed to do. So George Washington and Nathaniel Green would go to Philadelphia frequently to talk to Congress. And um, after one of those trips, Nathaniel wrote a letter, and in it he describes what he saw at, in Philadelphia. He said there were 17 tables overladen with food of all kinds, and that the congressmen had the best, you know, suits of uh, wool and, you know, shining buttons and the whole bit while he knew his soldiers back at camp were just getting by on the food, the meager food supplies they had and their uniforms were wearing out. So he would confront the congressman about supplying his troops. And unfortunately, in those confrontations, he made enemies of some um, powerful political figures. Um, and we'll get into that in a, in a little bit. Now, they finally did release him of the, the post of quartermaster general because he kept reminding them that they had agreed to the one year. But before they released him, they actually held hearings and they were going to dishonorably discharge him from the Continental Army because they felt like he was being insubordinate by not just going along with what they wanted him to do and stay in the post of quartermaster general. Now, Washington uh, got word that they were having these hearings about um, dishonorably discharging him. And he sent word to Congress and um, he had enough uh, individuals within Congress that had served in the Continental Army that they put up a defense for Nathaniel Green. And ultimately, ultimately, it was decided to keep him within the army, but relieve him of the post, which is all he wanted anyway, if he would train the next quartermaster general, which was never a problem in his mind. So he did in fact do that. And when he was relieved of the post, which was a post he had to uh, be involved in 24 seven, literally, he finally had some free time on his hands and he was given the command of West Point at that time. So he sent word to Katie to come to West Point and spend the winter with him there. That would be a leisure winter for them and what they had experienced in the last two winters. In fact, he told Katie to bring all four of their children. Now all four, all but the first child, the other three children are all conceived in camp and born during the war. And he had not seen three of them for quite a while. Katie would always bring the oldest son, George Washington Green, to camp when she came and would leave the rest with uh, Nathaniel's family in Rhode Island. Um, the, the Washingtons just loved to see little George Washington. So she brought him. Now, um, so Katie's on her way. We'll go back to that. Katie's on her way, so he thinks anyway, with the four children from Rhode Island and he gets word, actually, it was Alexander Hamilton came to Nathaniel Green one afternoon and told him that General, General Washington wanted to see him at headquarters immediately. So Green went to see Washington, and Green was told that he had been given the command of the Southern Department of the Continental Army, that the, the decision came both from Congress and General Washington. Now, the situation in the South was not good whatsoever. The, the focus of the war had switched to the South. 
Um, and the British were focusing down there, thinking that if they could divide the states, then they could divide and conquer type of thing. Washington had already sent two generals down and they both had failed miserably. One was captured and the other one actually abandoned his post. They were in a battle and they were losing the battle, um, General Gates, and he retreated and he just kept retreating. He just kept going. Yeah. <laughs> so um, Green was sent down was going to be set down. Now you have to understand, uh, Nathaniel Green, first of all, suffered with asthma and going down to the brutal climate of the South in the summer was more or less a death sentence for somebody that suffered with asthma. But also just a few weeks prior to this appointment to command the South, the Continental Army was talking about dishonorably discharging him. And only three, four weeks later, they want him to take command. He saw it as a punishment, basically. He didn't see it as a good thing. Uh, he knew going down there, he was going to have only 2,000 men within the, the troops, and half of them would be very ill, and all of them would be ill-supplied. <clears throat> when he got to the South, he immediately put everything he had learned as quartermaster general into motion to get supplies in. But the situation in the South was not the situation in the North. You had more Tories than Patriots down there, so not as many people willing to give supplies or food. And you also had distances between towns, vast distances to move the supplies he needed to. But he had, it, he had it working in a short amount of time. He also decided that he was going to separate his small army, which doesn't make much sense for the maxims of war, divide and conquer, as I said before. He kept the, the part of the army that was weak and ill with him to recuperate. And he sent the other half of his small army with um, General Dan Morgan to a place called the Cowpens. Um, and you can see that up there. And when the British heard that General Morgan was at the Cowpens, they were going to attack. And it had been decided prior to Morgan going there that when the British attacked, there would be a new strategy put into place, a new tactic that um, they would not depend on the militia units as much as they had in the past. They had their Continentals, which were well-trained and ready to face battle, but they also had the militia, same with up north, and they found that the militia units weren't as well-trained, so a little jittery or a lot jittery in battle. And when they would have the militia units up north, they knew that maybe they could get two, maybe three rounds out of them if they were lucky before they ran from the battlefield and left it to the Continentals. So down south, Green and Morgan decided immediately that what was going to have to happen was you tell the militia units that they only needed to give two shots. Give us two shots and you can leave. And that gave the militia units enough courage to give one shot anyway and then leave and that was enough for the continentals to be better prepared to take on the british and that's what they did in the battle of calpins and lo and behold it was a winning strategy and dan morgan held his own there um there was a british um officer a cavalry officer by the name of um um carl tarleton colonel tarleton and he was a young, only 24 years old, and he was a haughty, haughty guy. I don't know if anybody uh, listening saw the movie The Patriot with Mel Gibson years ago. And they depicted Tarleton in that. Um, and the one that would, went and burnt all the uh, colonists in the church and killed them that way. Well, Tarleton never did anything like that, but he did do horrific, horrific things. Um, when you fought with Colonel Tarleton, uh, there was no quarter. There was no quarter. You would be killed. He didn't take um, prisoners. And also, he was known to raid the towns down south and get the elderly and infirm, the men, 
put them in British uniforms and put them in the front line so their own family would be shooting and killing them not knowing it. He was a, a cruel man. Well, Tarleton was very upset that he lost this battle to Dan Morgan, so he ran back to his um, commanding officer who was Lord Cornwallis, General Cornwallis, and told him what had happened. So General Cornwallis immediately was going to go after Dan Morgan and, um, you know, put an end to this little, um, little bit of the Continental Army, about a thousand men. Well, Nathaniel Green heard what had happened. And well, right before I leave this, this page up here, you can see all of the battles and sieges that occurred in the Southern um, campaign after Nathaniel Green took command. Okay, quite, quite a lot of action there. Well, when Nathaniel Green heard about Dan Morgan and what had happened, that they had held their ground and he knew that um, Cornwallis would be after them. By this time, his portion of the army had healed. Um, they were, they had, um, their health was much better. So he was going to rendezvous with um, Dan Morgan at a place called Guilford Courthouse. That was the plan in North Carolina. And they figured that they would face Cornwallis at Guilford Courthouse, the combined troop. And there were rumors going around that he was supposed to have a few hundred militia units show up for that battle as well. Well, lo and behold, um, he found out in enough time, thank God, that the militia was not going to show up. And it was just his um, small little army that wasn't enough to stand up against General Cornwallis and the British Army in the South. So Nathaniel Green <clears throat> began um, what would become a major, major strategy of his in the South retreat. <laughs> he was always undersupplied, undermanned against the British down there. And he knew um, often he couldn't stand his ground on a battlefield. So he would retreat. And this first retreat uh, was the race to the Dan River, which uh, divides North Carolina from Virginia. And the plan was to get his entire force over the Dan River before the British could reach them. Um, <clears throat> it was going to be a hundred mile retreat. And it took about um, four days. Now the British were following them the entire way. Green found out that actually Cornwallis had burnt all their supplies, even burnt his own personal baggage in order to pick up speed to catch Green. Now the supply base for the British was in the deep south. So in going north towards Virginia, Green was actually pulling the British away from their supply base. And with the realization that they had destroyed all their supplies, um, he was excited about that, okay? But he just had to make it across that river. So for the four days, the back uh, line of the Continental Army could see the front line of the British Army. I mean, that's how close they were. And in the back of the Continental Army, it was um, Colonel uh, Lighthorse Harry Lee, who was the father of Robert E. Lee. And he would write in his journal about how he could see them. I mean, they weren't that far behind. And the Americans knew that um, if they stopped because everybody was so exhausted, the British were going to take that opportunity to stop as well because they were getting very little sleep and eating very little in these four days. And so there were stories that circulated. Um, one of them was about uh, one night they were going to um, stop for a couple of hours to sleep and Green's aides had found a little cabin just off the road and they were telling him to come to this cabin to sleep and you know they would sleep around him and have guards around him as well. Well, when they were retreating, the governor of South Carolina was with them. Um, and so the two of them were going to sleep in this bed in this cabin. And they kind of fell on top of the bed, absolutely exhausted. And you remember that I said Nathaniel Green suffered with asthma. Well, this was an old abandoned cabin 
and the dust from the blankets was coming up because Green thought the governor was moving around too much. So Green yelled out, governor, would you stop moving? And the governor yelled back at Green, general, it's not me, it's you. Well, they jumped out of the bed, the aides pulled back the blankets and there was a wild pig under the blanket. So the aides opened the door, let the wild pig out and then they all kind of fell back down where they were and fell asleep and nobody really knew if they hallucinated and imagined all of that or not, they were that exhausted. Um, but in that, uh, Green did make it to the river and his plan was, because Cornwallis assumed Green was going to take his army over the shallowest part of the river. Um, Green, in fact, was going to go over the deepest part of the river, the most dangerous part. And it was Harry Lee's job to try to trick the British into following his cavalry to the shallow part of the river rather than following the actual army. And as a good quartermaster general would do, Green had already planned to have boats waiting for the army at the river ahead of them. He got his entire army over the river and the cavalry horses before the British arrived. And thank God, Harry Lee did a very good job of, um, you know, leading them astray there. But even Harry got over the river safely. So Green is now in, um, Virginia, and they're safe and they can kind of regroup and, uh, you know, restock was the hope, the plan. And so Nathaniel Green went to Governor Thomas Jefferson. He was governor at that point. And he asked Governor Jefferson if he could please supply him with cavalry horses because their horses were at, worn out, totally worn out. They needed new horses and supply them with other things as well. And Thomas Jefferson's response was that he feared that if the British came up into Virginia, that he was going to need the cavalry horses and the supplies for his militia. So no, General Green couldn't have them. So he sent Green away without any supplies. And I wonder, and I think, and you know, this is the man that wrote the Declaration of Independence, but yet independence had not yet been achieved. I mean, it was these men out in the battlefield that were attempting to achieve the actual freedom and independence that Congress had declared a couple of years before. And yet this army was basically ignored. Green um, would write to the generals up north, and one of his statements to the generals, now I don't know, if, let me lean over to read it. There are few generals that have run oftener or more lustily than I have done, but I have taken care not to run too far and commonly have run as fast forwards as backwards to convince our enemy that we were like a crab that could run either way. This is the strategy that he took on in the South, always retreating, drawing them further from their supplies, the British further from them their supplies, and leaving the battlefields, or not even getting on the battlefields, retreating out of their reach. And it was a frustrating strategy for a general. Another thing he implemented in the South was guerrilla warfare. Um, he took on uh, militia generals like Francis Marion and Thomas Sumter to um, fight with their units in, uh, in guerrilla warfare. Another statement Green made to his friends up north was, we fight, get beat, rise, and fight again. I told you he had political enemies. Um, one of them, unfortunately, was John Adams. John, um, early on in the war, actually, the Continental Congress was accepting foreigners to come and take position of officers, such as Lafayette, such as von Steuben. They were both 
given positions as generals in the Continental Army. And those were two of the extraordinary ones. And there were more, there were more that were wonderful and thank God we had them. But there are a lot that came that weren't so good. And it was causing problems with the generals in the Continental Army, the American generals. And one such case was when Henry Knox was still Colonel of Artillery, there was no General of Artillery. And um, Henry's friends, were constantly asking Congress to give him the position as general of artillery because he was doing a, a, a wonderful job with it. And um, Congress kept ignoring them. And instead, there was a man that came from France who wanted the position uh, to head up the artillery. And they were going to make this man a major general. And some of the general officers were upset because first of all, Henry should have got that position first. And secondly, they questioned the integrity and the reason of why some of these foreigners were coming to fight America's war. And like I said, some of them obviously, you know, their integrity was pure, but they questioned this particular one for certain. And they wrote letters to Congress objecting to this man becoming um, the general of artillery. And they also found out that Congress was going to supersede their rank with this man, make him a major general, but make him um, outrank both Nathaniel Green and John Sullivan, the two division commanders. And so they objected to that as well. And what happened was this little battle of letters, you know, telling them that they were insubordinate and they needed to stop doing this and, you know, that they would decrease their rank, all kinds of threats from Congress. And the particular um, committee that headed this up was, was um, headed up by John Adams. And John Adams took great offense at um, these generals questioning his authority. And up until that point, John Adams and Nathaniel Green would regularly correspond. In fact, going back a little bit, when they were before the Declaration of Independence was written, Nathaniel Green had actually suggested to Congress through John Adams that they come up with the Declaration of Independence because, again, these men were in the field fighting for this. They had to declare it. Um, and as far as we know, he was the first one that had implored Congress to do this, to write a Declaration of Independence. So following this little battle of, um, of letters, John Adams stopped corresponding with Nathaniel Green, and they never did correspond throughout their lifetime. And one of the things John Adams um, stated that he regretted in his later years was that this rift had had formed between them. Another enemy, um, no, I'm sorry, wrong place, um, <laughs> he made was this man, uh, Robert Morris. And we'll go to the next up. Oh, I knew I was going to be doing that. Robert Morris was made um, the financer of the American Revolution. He was a very wealthy man. And he ended up controlling the monies that went to the army. Now, as I said, while Green was commanding the South, the Southern campaign, that was the focal point of the British. The main army under George Washington wasn't seeing much action. The action was in the South. And Washington was concerned that if he sent the main army down to the South, that the British would decide to come into the middle states and attack there. We also had a northern campaign, which wasn't seeing much action. It was the South. So Robert Morris was in charge of sending money down to Nathaniel Green to supply his troops. And what we have learned in a book that was published in um, the early 1800s, um, I forget the exact date, but uh, it was before 1820 maybe. And this was published by a man named William, jo William Johnson, who was a Supreme Court Justice at the time, and he was from South Carolina. And in this biography, it's amazing to read it. It's all about Nathaniel Green and the Southern Campaign. He talks about William Morris and how William Morris was holding monies back from the Southern Campaign. 
Remember, Green made some enemies in Congress because he stood his ground about supplying the troops. And now when he needed supplies for his Southern troops, it was being denied him. Hard, hard, hard to imagine, I mean, honestly, very hard to imagine it happened. Green sometimes would have his back up against the wall in supplying his troops, basic supplies, and then suddenly, according to William Johnson, monies would appear, monies would come. But the situation just got worse and worse. Um, finally, I'll go back here. Um, Green laid siege to Savannah and he laid siege to Charleston. And finally, the British abandoned the South. And, but prior to that, while he was laying siege, his army wasn't doing much fighting. There weren't many battles, a few skirm skirmishes, but no battles. And he was trying to keep them calm, keep them passive, and um, attempting to give them the food they needed and supplies they needed, but it wasn't working and he wasn't getting enough money to do it. So he had some money at the time that Congress had sent to him, and he actually made a deal with the merchants in Charleston that he would give them this money and Congress would pay them whatever else was owed if they would supply his troops while they were laying siege. And um, he actually hired a man to be the in-between, the merchants and him, to make these deals. And this man took the initial money, his name was John Banks, and he took the initial money and he was supposed to go and give it to the merchants, but instead he took the money and he disappeared with it. So um, there was no money to even um, barter with at this point. So the, the merchants said that they would supply Green's troops only if Green would sign his own name on the contract saying that if the Continental Congress did not send them the money, that Nathaniel Green personally would be responsible for paying off that debt. The war um, ended in the South, the British um, fled and Nathaniel Green disbanded his Southern army and went north and met with the army in New York. The British were still in New York, but were ready, getting ready to evacuate. There is a famous picture of George Washington saying farewell to his officers. And Nathaniel Green is not in that picture because he did not stay in New York long enough to see the British leave. He was war weary and he told George Washington that he had a family in Rhode Island that he dearly loved and he went home. But first he stopped at Congress in New York at the time and he resigned his commission. There was no fanfare. There was no acknowledgement of what he had accomplished and Congress said they were not going to pay for the supplies and the bills that were accrued in the South. So now he went home and of course back home in Rhode Island, his brothers had been manning the forges and the family businesses and really there was no work for Nathaniel to support his family. He is in huge debt at this point because Congress will not honor the bills of the Southern Command and he knows he needs to do something fast. Well, um, in the South, um, certain plantations that were abandoned by Tories were given to some of the officers that fought in the Southern Command. And Green actually was given three different properties. He was given, um, oh gosh, I can't even remember that, uh, like a thousand acres in um, the frontier of North Carolina, which is now um, Nashville, Tennessee area but it was worthless to him at the time. There was nothing there. He was given a plantation in South Carolina, 2,500 acres, and the same amount of plantation in Savannah, Georgia. He immediately sold the plantation in South Carolina, which would bring more money. And excuse me, he used that money to pay off a portion of the debt, not much. And then he moved his family. Now he has five children moved Katie and the five children down to Savannah, Georgia into this plantation. 
And this was um, actually what the house looked like, not a big sprawling plantation, like gone with the wind type of thing. And you probably can't, I don't know if you can make that out. <clears throat> I've been to the site of Mulberry Grove um, and all that's left is basically the brick steers toppled over down there. Um, he tried to make it work. He was going to plant rice. Um, unfortunately, uh, as a Quaker, he was opposed to slavery and now he finds himself basically having to enter into this type of situation to get this plantation up and running. Um, there are a lot of um, instances in his letters where he talks about his slaves and taking care of them and being uncomfortable with the whole situation but in fact he did enter into that um <clears throat> he had a good rice crop going and a hurricane came in and wiped it out so uh there was just stress upon stress upon stress in his life he went into uh savannah proper one day to meet with his attorney and one of the creditors who was demanding to be paid. And um, after meeting with them, he was riding back to Mulberry Grove with Katie in the, um, their um, yeah, carriage. And he wanted to stop at a neighboring plantation, which was right next to his, because he wanted to see how that um, plantation owner was doing with his rice and learn from him. So he walked the plantation for a couple of hours without his hat on, it said, and it was a hot June day. Came back to the carriage with Katie and they went home and he said he didn't feel well. That night, um, he didn't eat much. He wasn't feeling well, went to bed. And his situation got worse over the course of the next few days. And within a week, Nathaniel Green was dead. He was 44 years old. The Continental Army, well now the, the debt goes to Katie, his wife, and the Continental Army still refuses to cover the debt. And this is where Nathaniel was um, initially buried in Savannah. And in uh, early 1900, there was a, a battle going on between um, Georgia and Rhode Island about claiming his body. Rhode Island wanted it to be brought back home, but Georgia ended up winning. And that was when they uh, moved his uh, remains in, it was like 1901, I believe, and moved him to what is now Johnson Square in Savannah and erected this memorial. His son is also buried with him. After he died, um, Katie um, he was struggling, obviously, to make ends meet. And young George Washington Green was of age to, be ed to go off and be educated. And George Washington, Henry Knox, and Lafayette all offered to cover the expenses of his education. And Lafayette won and had him come to Paris and live with his own family. Lafayette himself had a son named George Washington, and the boys were about the same age. And when um, the French Revolution began, um, Lafayette sent George Washington Green back home, of course. And within a couple of weeks of returning home, the the teenager went out on the Savannah River in a, a boat with a couple of friends and the boat um, uh, capsized and George Washington Green died. So Katie not only had, you know, to deal with the death of her husband and this great debt she was under, but also dealing with um, her, son's, her son's death now. Another political enemy that Nathaniel made, well, not a political enemy, he was actually more of a, a military enemy when it started, was General Thomas Sumter. I mentioned his name earlier. He was a militia general who, pre who was uh, doing the guerrilla warfare in the South. Um, Thomas Sumter was kind of a loose cannon. He didn't like to be told what to do. He was the general and he commanded his men and he didn't want Nathaniel Green necessarily telling him what to do even though Nathaniel Green was commander of the entire self. Um, so uh, Sumter tended to resent that and the resentment went on and Thomas Sumter ended up becoming a congressman after the war. 
And then there was James Gunn. James Gunn was from Savannah. He was in the militia as well, a captain, a cavalry captain. And when the war ended, Nathaniel Green put out a general order that all the cavalry courses needed to be returned because they were federal property. And James Gunn didn't like that order because he kind of liked his horse and he wanted to take his horse home with them. So he got into this back and forth with Green and of course Green wins in the end because they are federal horses and James Gunn carries a grudge. In fact, he carried a grudge to the point that he told Nathaniel Green if he ever saw him out in the streets of Savannah, he would shoot him dead. So Nathaniel Green would carry pistols with them all the time. Nathaniel Green actually wrote a letter to George Washington because Gunn wanted to duel him and asked Washington, you know, told Washington what he felt about that and asked Washington's opinion. And they both agreed that a general officer, any officer could not agree to a duel because otherwise all these you know, soldiers would come out of the woodwork and want to duel with them because they didn't like the orders they gave them at one time or another. So, you know, when I talk about James Gunn, I like to talk about some of the guys that served in the army. Um, did you guys get to take your Jeeps or tanks home? I don't know, I don't know. Was James Gunn being unreasonable? Now, George Washington, when he became president, he made a Southern tour and he stopped twice at Mulberry Grove to visit Katie Green and her children. Now, I always like to talk about Katie here. Katie has been put down by modern historians. Um, basically, they say she was a wild woman. She slept around, that, you know, one of her children wasn't even Nathaniel's child. I mean, all these wild stories. There was a biography that came out of, about her in the 1770s that took excerpts of letters that Nathaniel had written to her, just short little blurbs of the letters and created a whole story around the blurb. There was one case where he was telling her he didn't want her going out, he wanted her to rest, he wanted her to stay home. And the authors of that book went on to say that Katie was an alcoholic and he was trying to tell her to stay home so she wouldn't go out and be drinking and, you know, partying and all this. Well, the letters of Nathaniel Green began to come out around that time. There are 13 volumes of his actual letters. And when you pull these letters out in their entirety and read them. And I'll just that one as an example. Nathaniel Green was saying to her, he wanted her to stay home and he wanted her to rest because she had just given birth to a baby and he thought she was trying, starting to get too active too quickly with just normal routine things. And um, people would just, you know, go with it with Katie Green. Um, in fact, historians say that when George Washington, some historians, that when George Washington stopped to visit Katie at Mulberry Grove, it was because they were having a secret affair. Um, probably the truth of it, because you see that house isn't that big to start with. Katie had five children. She also had servants throughout that house and she had a tutor for the five children. So I don't know where they would have gone, but. Uh, whatever. Um, probably, in likelihood, George Washington was counseling Katie on how to approach Congress to get the money back that Nathaniel, um, the debt that Nathaniel was under and she was under now. And we know this is a great probability simply because after George Washington went back to Washington, Alexander Hamilton, as the Secretary of Treasury, helped draft a 20-page document for Katie to present to Congress. And she, in fact, did go up to Washington and presented this to Congress. Now, it took about a week for Congress to decide whether or not they were going to take on the debt that was actually their debt and relieve Katie of it. And the reason it took so long, it was a very close uh, call on it in the end, was because both Thomas Sumter and James Gunn were congressmen that did not want to give the money uh, to her, her free Katie of the debt. But she did in fact win with the help of Alexander Hamilton. Katie would go on um, 
to um, take care of that plantation. She finally left and moved to a place called Cumberland Island that she and Nathaniel um, had purchased on their own and they intended to move their, their family to Cumberland. Um, it's off the coast of Georgia, Florida, right on the border. And it's now a national park. Cumberland Island has a lot of live oak trees on it. Nathaniel's hope was that they could take these trees and provide the lumber to make ships for the American Navy. In fact, um, Old Ironsides, the USS Constitution, is made out of wood from Cumberland Island. And once I was um, on the Constitution taking some friends to tour it, and I had mentioned this to the captain that, you know, it's called Old Ironsides and Nathaniel Green was an iron man. Master, and I was thrilled when he asked me to give a talk on their yearly roundabout about it. So that was just, it was wonderful. I loved it. Um, so Katie also, she had um, a tutor, as I said, for the children. His name was Phineas Miller. He was there when Nathaniel was alive. And Phineas Miller had a friend from Connecticut that was also called down to tutor some children in the Savannah area. But when um, this other man got there, the family had changed their mind and they didn't need his services. So this, this young man had nowhere to go. So Phineas Miller asked Katie if he could live with them and work, you know, for them. And um, she agreed to it. And he liked to, to make little things, invent little things. He would make toys for the kids and things like that. And he was working on a project and he brought it to the attention of Katie and Phineas Miller one evening because he had hit an impasse with his invention. He was trying to separate the seed from the cotton and he just didn't know how to do that. So Katie went over to the fireplace and she grabbed a hearth brush and she brought it over and she showed this young man how if he put a brush there, it would, it would separate the seeds. This young man um, was Eli Whitney and Katie is on the original patent of the cotton gin. But the saddest part about the cotton gin is slavery increased after its, um, its um, invention. And uh, it's just, that's just sad. <laughs> so now the original base of the original cotton gin is near Mulberry Grove, the, uh, what's left of the Mulberry Grove. You can see the base of that. And basically the forest is just taking over that area, um, which is very sad. Now, um, a little bit more about Katie, maybe we're talking about her being maligned. Um, there was one story that their last child was not Nathaniel's child. Katie had gone down south when Nathaniel um, established himself down there. She spent the last year down there with him. And when the British evacuated the south, he sent Katie up uh, north by ship and she was gonna stop in New York and see Martha Washington and all her friends and then head on after she recuperated a little bit and he was going up by land. And uh, we know the last date that they were together. Um, I don't remember it off the top of my head right now, but Katie ended up pregnant and she got home and she was pregnant. And Nathaniel talks in one of his letters about the fact that, you know, she's ready to have the baby, but she's overdue and they're waiting any moment now. And of course, people put the dates together and figured that she was like 44 weeks pregnant by the time she delivered this child. So therefore it wasn't Nathaniel Green's child. She was doing something when she was in Philadelphia. And I went to a couple of obstetrician friends of mine and I asked them about this thinking maybe it's true. Um, and they both told me that it wasn't unusual back then for a woman to go 44 weeks. In fact, the wheel that, and the guys don't know this, but the wheel that the obstetricians use to determine the due date when a woman comes to them has 44 weeks on it. So was it Nathaniel's child, wasn't it? I don't know, but it just is disturbing that people have nothing better to do than to put 21st century immorality on 18th century individuals. So, so um, Nathaniel Grain, as I said, lays and rest in Savannah, Georgia. Um, they remember him in the South. 
for the Southern Campaign, one of the things he had hoped to do during the Southern Campaign was to allow the slaves of the Southerners to fight in the Continental Army and earn their freedom. And um, the governors and the state legislatures wouldn't allow that. And uh, William Johnson, the Supreme Court Justice, does say in his biography that even in 1820, they were people that still hated him for even um, putting that forth that they should earn their freedom that way. But um, he was negated in history. Um, he died young, of course, but he also made some enemies, powerful, powerful enemies. And it's only now I know that um, David McCullough in his 1776 uh, mentions Nathaniel Green quite a bit and kind of brought him out of the shadows a little, but still not as much as he should have been. George Washington, in fact, told Nathaniel Green at one point that if anything were to have happened to him, either he would become sick or captured, that Nathaniel Green was to take command of the Continental Army. So, okay, I will finish it with that. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. I don't, I, I don't see any questions coming in. Mm-hmm, no questions or comments, huh? Have you seen anything? Question is, did Katie die in the South? Katie did die. She was on Cumberland Island. Um, an, interesting, an interesting thing is uh, when she was down on Cumberland Island, she had uh, a, a, a former continental soldier that wanted to visit her and his family her. And during the war, she knew at her five at all, Washington's aides. But by this time, when he asked to come and visit her at Cumberland Island, he had already killed Alexander Hamilton, who was a dear friend of the Greens. So Katie um, didn't want to be rude. Um, and she told Berg, yes, he certainly could come and stay at Cumberland Island. And she left before he got there and didn't return until after he left. So she was not entertaining him. But she did uh, die at the age of, I think it was 52, um, down there. It was after the War of yeah, 1812. Yeah, picking up your microphone and her and that's right. Is it okay? Yeah. yeah. It was after the War of 1812 and the soldiers, uh, the American soldiers were staying at Cumberland Island. And um, they would like, enjoy hearing the stories from the city of Austin. All right, end it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.